ASH 2015 coverage in Orlando, Florida continues. I'm Thomas Baldrick, joined now by Dr. Yogan Santhara Raja from the Cleveland Clinic. How did I do on that? You did pretty good. All That's right, good, yeah. all right. So let's talk about the research you're doing for uh, MDS and AML patients. Right. What study are you presenting data right. for here? So there are only two drugs FDA approved uh, to treat all subtypes of myelodysplastic syndrome. These two drugs, decidabine and 5-azacitidine, are also very important for patients with acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, they extend survival for patients with, with acute myeloid leukemia as well. Uh, but unfortunately, neither agent by itself is a cure. So almost inevitably, uh, every patient benefiting from, this, from these drugs, uh, the disease will eventually, in every patient, the disease will eventually relapse. So uh, the, the big question uh, really as it pertains to these two drugs is, you know, they work great, but why is it that eventually uh, you see the, the treatment selects for a subset of the leukemia cell population or the, the myeloid malignancy population that is able to grow despite the therapy and you know, basically cause the disease to recur. And uh, so we were addressing that question, the question of resistance. So before we get into what you found, yeah. what was your hypothesis going in? Right, right. So, so we had a very simple uh, notion. Uh, we know exactly what these drugs are trying to do. They're trying to, to actually deplete from the cancer cell population uh, a specific epigenetic protein called DNMT1 or DNA methyltransferase 1. DNMT1 for short. So we know what this, these drugs are trying to do. And since we know what they're trying to do, we can measure that. And so we can uh, modify the question about, you know, how is resistance occurring to a, to a first step, first, a logical first step, which is, hey, are the drugs actually doing what they're supposed to be doing, that is depleting DNMT1, or is it that resistance is because the drugs are uh, doing what they're supposed to be doing, but the cancer cells don't care? So is it because the drugs are not actually achieving that DNMT1 depletion, or is it because they are achieving it, but the cancer cells don't care? So that was the, the first step. And uh, when, we, when we actually uh, tried to answer that question, we found that uh, resistance was with cancer cells that somehow avoided uh, that effect of the drug. So it wasn't that the drug went into the cells and depleted DNMT1 and the cancer cells said, yeah, you know, so what, and just kept on growing. It said that it was that the cancer cells were not even being subject to that effect of the drug. So the drugs, we were giving them to the patient in the expectation that the drugs were going to go in to the cancer cells and remove DNMT1, but that wasn't happening. So DNMT1 was not being removed. So the, the, the resistance was because DNMT1 was not being removed altogether. So now the next question is why? And so the next question was why? And so there too, fortunately, we actually understand how it is that these drugs get into cancer cells and how they eventually, we know in a step-by-step -step molecular fashion, you know, this has been worked out over decades, exactly how it is that these drugs deplete the NMT1. So, so we looked at each one of those steps and we found that, that uh, uh, resistance was occurring basically uh, at two levels. One, uh, cancer cells, uh, when they relapse, they were increasing the levels of an enzyme which inactivates the drugs. So there's an enzyme called cytidine deaminase, or CDA, which deaminates the cytobine and 5 a cytidine and converts them to their uridine counterparts, which cannot deplete the NMT1. And uh, very, very often, at the time of relapse, the cancer cells had upregulated CDA, thus shifting the dose response curve to the cytobine and 5 a cytidine to the right. You would need a higher concentration in order to achieve what was being done with a lower concentration uh, previously. So that was the first thing these uh, cancer cells were doing. And the second thing they were doing is, uh, decidabine and 5 azacitidine are actually what we call pro-drugs. They have to be uh, uh, modified before they can actually deplete the NMT1. That modification is by a phosphorylation step. And the enzymes that phosphorylate decidabine and 5 azacitidine it's two different enzymes. 5-azacitidine has a ribose sugar as its backbone, and decitabine has a deoxyribose sugar at its, as its backbone. And so decitabine is phosphorylated by an enzyme called DCK, and 5-azacitidine uh, is phosphorylated by an enzyme called uridine cytidine kinase 2. And so very interestingly, at the time of relapse, 
cancer cells being treated with decidabine would suppress DCK and they would upregulate UCK2. So they need, uh, so, so step back a little bit, decidabine and 5 a cytidine are cytidine analogs. They're analogs of the C that goes into DNA. Now in order for a cancer cell to divide, it has to bring in Cs to duplicate its DNA. And so that's what these drugs exploit, is the fact that they need the Cs and then they'll take in the decidabine. But what these resistant cells were doing when they were being exposed to decidabine, instead of using DCK to bring in decidabine, they would shift, shift to UCK2 and they'd bring in the ribose form of the C. And therefore they would avoid the decidabine. And with 5 a cytidine, they'd do the opposite. So because 5 a cytidine is phosphorylated by UCK2, they would downregulate UCK2 and they'd upregulate DCK. Now the, the obvious implication therefore is that when, when the cancer cell tries to avoid decidabine by this strategy, it actually increases its vulnerability to 5 a cytidine and vice versa. So when the cancer cell avoids 5 a cytidine by downregulating UCK2 and upregulating DCK, it renders itself more vulnerable to decidabine. And so we tested these, these principles in, in mice. And we showed that, uh, in fact, when you alternate decidabine and 5 a cytidine, you can actually dramatically extend the response duration to this, uh, this form of therapy. And uh, uh, remember, I started out by talking about the enzyme that cancer cells upregulate in order to deaminate and destroy uh, decidabine and 5 a cytidine. If we inhibited that enzyme, we could even further dramatically extend survival all without toxicity. What do you think this means for patients? So the good news is, is that uh, all of this is, uh, these are very actionable uh, findings. These are things that we don't have to wait, wait for theory or a new molecule or a new gene. Or We, we can actually act on this uh, tomorrow. And so we are going to act on it. So we're going to, uh, we're, we're going to be starting clinical trials with decidabine in combination with an inhibitor of cytidine deaminase and uh, we're working towards uh, hopefully doing clinical trials where uh, the cytidine in combination with the inhibitor of cytidine deaminase will be alternated with 5 a cytidine in combination with an inhibitor of cytidine deaminase and in that way we hope to rationally uh, extend the response duration uh, to these drugs. Exciting news Dr. Yogan. Keep Thank us posted you. would you I come will. back? Thank you much. Thank you sir. My pleasure.